Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Sean Reeves. And we discussed this afternoon about his journey. Of course, he's here to tell you his journey of faith. What theme would be appropriate for his journey? And it was very appropriate that uh, actually a common theme came up, a theme that we've covered often on The Journey Home program over the last six years. But as we thought a nice title, the title that came to the surface was the idea of, who told you that? Who said so? The image that comes to my mind is that image of, of a couple kids sitting around and they're starting to argue over something and one of them says something real audacious and the other says, wait a second, who told you that? Where'd you get that from? Where'd you get that strange idea from? I'm also reminded back in the days when I was in Protestant seminary, we'd sit around a table, 10, 15 of us, drinking coffee in the evening, relaxing, all of us Bible-believing. We love Jesus Christ. We all believe the scriptures, the authoritative word of God, and yet we'd sit there and argue over the meaning of baptism, the meaning of the Lord's Supper, or the pre and post, and ah, millennialism, and when's the, the end going to come? And, and at some point, somebody would come up with some wild idea, and the idea would be, wait a second, where'd you get that from? What's the basis, or the credentials, or the authority behind that idea that you've given your life to? And it was that idea, along with a couple, that grasped Sean in the midst of his spiritual journey, and that's what he's here to tell you tonight. The phone number for you to call with your questions, remember you're an important part of this program, is 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Sean, welcome to The Journey Home. Thank you, pleasure to be here. We have a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. That's true. Dr. Kenneth Howell, which I know the audience, if you've watched not only the Journey Home program, but Mother Angelica Live. He's been on uh, Johnette's program with me a couple times, mm -hmm. and Ken's a good old friend, and uh, uh, I kind of miss him. I don't see him very often, but as I told you earlier, give him a hard time. I he's, will. He's I got will. a book that he's published. I didn't even <laughs> know he's published a book. And kept secret from you. <laughs> I can't believe that, and I gave him a copy of my novel of all things, but I don't I'll want make sure you get one in two weeks. Okay, great. Okay. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Let's begin as we do every week. And I'd like to invite you to share with the audience your early spiritual journey. All right. Well, basically, um, my mother's family is Catholic. My, my father is Protestant. So I had a kind of an odd beginning of my spiritual life where I had this kind of uh, combination of Catholicism and, and, and Protestantism in my early youth. Hmm. Um, I don't really remember very much of that because by the time the age of 12, um, my parents had given me a choice whether to be Catholic or be Protestant because until then I would attend mass with my mother and mm. attend Protestant service with my father and uh, and I was Did you get formed very much in the Catholic faith? No, I really didn't I really didn't uh, I didn't attend CCD or anything like that. Uh, I really didn't understand what was going on at mass. Um, I liked the structure of it, but uh, something about it, you know, wasn't very welcoming. Yeah. And I, at my Protestant church, well I had many friends my age, we sang, you know, songs that were very exciting and things like that. And so I felt more welcome at the Protestant church and understood a little bit more about what was happening because uh, it, it wasn't as liturgical. Oh. And so uh, a lot of it was just, well, we sing, we listen to scripture, and we have a little bit of fellowship. That's, that's great. So I decided about the age of 12 that I really didn't want to be Catholic. I wanted to be Protestant. And so through my adolescence, those, those years, those formation years where I learned, you know, the theology of of the Trinity and 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 Sola Scriptura mm -hmm. and um, you know salvation through faith alone things like that which became enveloped into my personhood and who mm -hmm. I was and my peers and everything uh, and all those people shared those views and and, and that shaped who I was uh, so through those those formative years uh, I was essentially raised Protestant. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the summer before I went to college, I graduated high school in in 1995. I was going to the University of Illinois. And uh, something happened that really shocked me. Um, up until that time, I had thought my world of Christianity was divided into what was Catholic and what was not Catholic. And my understanding of Protestantism was, well, we all are not Catholic. We're all pretty much the same thing. We have different varieties of how we like to worship. You know, uh, we have charismatics and they like to, you know, worship the Holy Spirit and praise and with their hands up in the air and things like that. And we have, um, other people who uh, are not as charismatic, but we all basically believe the same things, faith in the Bible alone, sola scriptura, uh, faith in um, salvation through faith alone, things like that were pretty much the same. And so my idea of Christianity was what well, was Catholic, what was not Catholic. 
suddenly I realized it's a lot more complex than that because what happened was my church basically split down the center over an issue of baptism. Hmm. And this was very difficult for me. Did a couple key leaders disagree on its it interpretation was of Scripture? The, the church that we belonged to at that time, I grew up in the military, so we moved all over the place. The church we belonged to at that time, um, basically the elders, hmm. I think probably a group of about 10 or 12 men, were at odds, basically split down the center, half of them believing that that uh, you need to be immersed and, and you need to be in a certain state, certain rubrics about what baptism was, and the others didn't believe that. And so far that even some claimed the others weren't saved. Yeah. Some said that, well, mm -hmm. you're not really baptized then, you're not going to heaven. Really shocked me and caused me to kind of spiral into, uh, well, what is truth? What, <laughs> what am I to believe then? Because these people who I had believed and put so much faith into their teaching, they don't agree on it. There's much more to this Christianity than just being Catholic or not being Catholic. You know, it's, uh, I know there's some in the audience, uh, especially Catholics, that couldn't imagine uh, it, seeing this happen, a, a little church split over uh, not only the, the, the interpretation of a particular text or a particular dogma in that sense, mm -hmm. but immediately saying you're not saved because you don't believe the way I do. Mm -hmm. you know, and the truth is, I, mean, I saw that a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. in the different groups that I was involved, especially in the congregationalism where every individual church kind of was its, kind of set itself on what it believed in that individual church. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean that, that does happen and it's right. sad. Yeah. And yeah. an awful lot of Protestants are in these groups that just presume that their little group and what they've been told was true mm -hmm. and anyone outside that believes differently obviously either isn't true or just isn't saved. Mm -hmm. Well when you look back at that time you're, you're caught in this crisis of determining, well, talk more about that. There's this mm -hmm. theme we've chosen. Mm -hmm. You know, who told you that? Mm -hmm. How does that fit into that early part? Did, did, was that a thought that kind of came to your mind as you were struggling between these two different sides? Or? Oh, very much. And in, in, in retrospect, it, I, I kind of find it fascinating that that, that that infallible teaching office that we put place on the magisterium as Catholics, I had superimposed on my pastors and my elders in my church, mm -hmm. I had believed that, well, whatever they say is true. They know the Bible better than I do, and they know how to interpret it, and, and um, I believe whatever they say. And so once I realized that, well, they're, they're saying different things amongst themselves, mm -hmm. I started thinking, well, who am I to believe? If, if, if one guy uh, is saying one thing and one guy is saying another thing, well, obviously, one mm -hmm. of them's not right, maybe neither of them are right, who do I believe? I needed some kind of source. Well, I know you were pretty young at that point. Do, do you remember back, did they, were they pointing beyond themselves to defend their particular position? In other words, they would say, okay, mm -hmm. this, this verse in First Peter about baptism means this because, would they point to somebody else or were they just pointing to their interpretation of it? Yeah, it was very much an individual interpretation of it. That, um, that was the mindset that I had grown up with was that um, all you need to know to interpret the scripture well uh, you just need the Holy Spirit, um, that, and then, then you can interpret the Bible perfectly. Well, there you go. Now they're saying, this is true because the Holy Spirit told it to me. Right. I mean, they may not say it that audaciously, right. but that's implied. Right. You know, I've been given the Holy Spirit by grace. He's leading me in this interpretation, mm -hmm. and I feel in here that this is what it says. Mm -hmm. Correct. All right. Correct. Well, what if the other person says, but that the Holy Spirit told me this? Well, right. then... <laughs> Again, we're not hearing the Holy Spirit very well, I guess. Right, and, that, and that, was the, that was the pitfall that I fell in, is that, well, we all have the same text, we all have the same Bible, we all have, presumably, this Holy Spirit. Um, these are constants that we all have. Yeah. What are the variables that make us so different? Hmm. And what I realize is the, the only variables are who we are, our experiences, our view on reality, hmm our view of what this word actually means, what these words are saying. And so it looks like it's based on the Bible because we have the Holy Spirit. But in reality, it's just because I believe it says this or not, me yeah. personally. Yeah. yeah, the danger of that. Well, what got you out of that hole? What, what opened your heart to the church? Well, it was a very difficult journey. I, when, I, when I came to college, I initially wanted to figure these things out. But um, as any college student will tell you, you get into classes, you get into exams, yeah. papers, things like that. Plus, you're trying to have a social life, make friends, um, hopefully meet a significant other. Uh, those <laughs> things kind of quell 
that pursuit f for a period of time. And so I became, um, I, I became content to simply say, well, I'll figure that out later. I, I, I joined a uh, Protestant organization, a Christian organization, uh, and eventually became a leader mm -hmm. in, in that organization and was content just to believe what they called the essentials. Okay. Uh, just that you believe in the Trinity, you believe in, in salvation through faith alone, and you believe in sola scriptura. Uh, and that's all you really need yeah. to be a Christian. And I said, okay, well, um, I don't really believe that, but I don't have time to figure the rest out. Yeah. So I'm just going to be content with that, and I'll be a, a Christian leader, and I'll, I'll try to work these other things out in my life, and then, and then um, I'll figure these things out later. Let me put a comment in here, because this, this is very uh, uh, significant and common, because, and I, I saw this in college, when I look back on the same thing, and also at seminary, we may come out of a, a problem like you just described, where, mm -hmm. wait a second, why do they have this, these different views on baptism or even on what a person must be to be saved when, when it's both based on Scripture, you see this problem. So the solution is to just kind of turn your face away and get involved in this other Christian group mm -hmm. in which now I'm with these other leaders. Mm -hmm. They are trustworthy. Right. They have good lives. They really believe it. So I don't have to worry about it. I can trust them and be like them and then be a leader passing on to others what they have said is true. Right. We end up passing on because those guys said it and I believe it because I know they're trustworthy. And so I emulate them and pass it on sometimes unexamined because they said it. Right. Yeah. But does that describe kind of what, what happened to you at that point? I mean, yeah, and, but that didn't suffice. Right. Um, it, it kept nagging at my heart after a while. Um, my wife tells me I think too much, but that's just because uh -huh. I'm analytical in nature. I, 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 I do not settle well with things that I can't figure out. Um, <laughs> and here I am Catholic, uh, having to settle for the great mysteries of God that, that are in the Catholic faith. Yeah. But there are certain things that, um, that I, I know, well, uh, God has given us reason, He's given us intellect, uh, I need to figure this out as, n enough as, as much as possible, and I can't just sit here and not think. Mm -hmm. So after a while, um, I started thinking, boy, this, this, this theology is very minimalistic, I still haven't answered this question, mm -hmm. and it just nagged at my heart, and, and I started thinking about it a lot more. And what happened really disturbed me, because mm -hmm. over time I realized I don't believe in Sola Scriptura anymore. <laughs> How that happened? Tell me the steps leading up to that issue? Basically, I, I thought about that question, you know, who said so? Why do I believe this? Mm -hmm. If, thinking back to 1995, um, my elders don't agree on this. We all have the same scripture. We all have the same Holy Spirit. Um, yet they're not agreeing on the same things. Then how am I to know what to believe? How am I to, kn to know that what I'm interpreting in scripture is not wrong? Mm -hmm. There must be something outside of scripture to help me with that. Um, on top of that, uh, then I started asking questions about, well, you know, where did we get the Bible at all? Um, it, it, it seemed odd to me to believe that um, the Bible is the sole authority because the Bible says it's the sole authority. I mean, I could write a book and, say, and, and write in it, this is the Word of God, and start telling people, this is the Word of God, look at it. But what makes it the Word of God? How do I know it's the Word of God? And I started thinking about my experience about the Bible. I'd grown up believing the Bible was the Word of God, believing the Bible uh, was the center of, of Christianity, the center of, of our life. Um, but why did I believe that? Well, I believed it first because my father told me. And then my pastor reinforced that. It was only later after that had happened that my faith made that set into stone, a fact. But I don't believe anybody wakes up one day and says, well, uh, here's this book, and it says it's the sole authority, so I'm just going to believe it. You know, somebody tells them first. Yeah. Even people who don't have Christians around them, even people who did not grow up in, 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 in Christianity, um, you know, say they go to a hotel and they find a Gideon Bible. Well, they have the understanding that somebody else has already said in our culture yeah. at one point in time that this is the Word of God. They were first told it, mm -hmm. and then they had the faith in it. And often, even I think it was John Calvin, it talks about that we know it's the Word of God because of the witness of the Spirit from within when mm -hmm. we read it. You know, we read this and we just somehow know within that it's true, that, that mm -hmm. witness of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's actually the same exact argument that the Mormons use 
to read the, the Book of Mormon. In other words, you right. read it and pray that the Spirit would guide you and, and you'll get this warm feeling and know that it's true. Well, right. a lot of people have read lots of things and been moved by a warm feeling inside that this is really true. Is that, again, authority enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is that just something you ate for lunch? You know, right. how do you know that it's true? Right, right. So you were struggling with, with Sola Scriptura, and uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure all who are watching realize how shattering that can be to an evangelical when, well, what do you trust anymore? Right. And I what mean, happened to you at that point? I mean, what did you do with the Scripture? That was the heart of my faith. Scripture was Christianity. And to say that there's something more than to Scripture, to say that Scripture is not the sole authority, um, kind of places myself in limbo, yeah. in, 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 in theological limbo, because I'm no longer effectively Protestant. But I didn't believe the same things that the Catholics believe, so I'm not Catholic either. I'm stuck in between, <laughs> trying to figure things out. Um, and so I started investigating, well, I, I know that there's some other variables to interpreting Scripture that must be extra biblical, or else we're in doctrinal chaos, because we're just erring minds following erring minds, unless mm -hmm. there's something that's divinely led to say, yes, this is really true. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is true, this is not or else um, everybody can make their own interpretation and everybody can make their own doctrine and the Bible is just this mystery. It's this code book to how you should be or what you should believe, but nobody can ever truly figure it out. Uh, so I knew there must be something else. There must be something outside of scripture. And so I started searching. Um, I, I knew my church didn't claim to, to have any, any extra biblical authority. Uh, so I started looking at other, other denominations saying, well, what did they say about this? So I looked at Presbyterians, I looked at Methodists, I looked at um, Episcopalians, uh, Baptists, and tried to figure out, well, you know, what did they say about Sola Scriptura? What did they say about um, basically the doctrines that, that hmm. started this, you know, baptism, things like that. Um, and so the one thing I found is that the only church that claimed to be this extra biblical uh, authority was the Catholic Church, but I didn't want to be Catholic. <laughs> um, so um, I said, "Well, let me let me figure this out a different way. Um, let me look to the root of things. I believe the the Bible is the Word of God. Um, I know that most people have to be told that first before they really have a faith that oh, this is the Word of God. It doesn't just come to you automatically." Um, but I thought, well, how do we get the Bible? You know, um, because I had already grown, I, w I had always grown up thinking that we just, you know, it just fell out of heaven. We just mm -hmm. got this big book and God said, here you go, and plop, and there we go. And I realized after doing a little bit of historical study, because uh, my minor in college was history, uh, so I, I, I learned a little bit about, hey, we didn't always have the Bible in this form. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, where did it come from? And what I realized was, uh, it, it really shocked me that uh, in the very beginning of the church, well, they didn't have all the Bible. The, the first letter of the New Testament wasn't written until several decades after Christ. The first gospel, several decades after that. And so um, that just shattered any other notion of, of Sola Scriptura that I had had. Because then this definitively points out that at some point in time, the Bible as we have it, they had the Old Testament but not the New Testament, wasn't there. So there, there obviously was some other extra biblical authority because there was a void of scripture. If scripture is the only authority, well then there was no authority at that point in time. Um, but that was easy enough to answer. I mean, even, even scripture says that Christ gave authority to the apostles. Right. Uh, so that was, that was easy enough to answer. But then what I started thinking about is, well, uh, I discovered that the canon of scripture, the compilation that we have now, didn't come into effect until several centuries after that. That there were all these other, uh, sorry, uh, texts running around, the mm -hmm. Gospel of Thomas, uh, the Revelation of Paul, things like that. The decay, the right, shepherd right. of Hermes. That never that. got into yeah. the canon that we have now. Or that, below at some time, some of the early lists included some of those books. Right, and then were taken out later, yeah, yeah. and were disputed and things like that. But the canon that we have really didn't come around until the end of the fourth century and then was reaffirmed by the Pope in the beginning of the fifth century. 
And so if that's the case, if, if we had scripture, but it wasn't realized hmm. until the fourth century, well, what happened between that time where there were no apostles, there was no effective scripture, hmm. and then there was scripture? What, what was the authority then? Hmm. That was even the harder question. Hmm. And that begged, that begged the question that, well, obviously, there must have been something that God gave us to lead his people, divinely inspired, or else it's just chaos because there's, there's no authority to guide the people on what they should believe and how they should believe it, how they should live. Um, and even more, even further than that, then you think of, well, so we have what's called a canon. We have a group of people that came together, they took all these different texts and they said, well, this is inspired, this is not, this is really nice, but you know, it's not the word of God. Well, why? Why do they have the right to do that? <laughs> Where did that come from? Yeah. It, there was some kind of authority there. And so it became very apparent to me, well, yes, here's the authority I was looking for. There was something there. I was right about that. There is more than just scripture. The, the very fact that we have scripture at all was because first we had some people that said, this is what scripture, because first we had some people that were apostles and wrote it. Mm -hmm and said, this is the word of God. And they had the authority to put it together and say, everyone else, listen to this. This is the word of God. These other things are not. What right did they have? They had a divine right. That was the, the inspired uh, leadership of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And it became clear to me, well, if that happened then, there must be some authority now it's a very cruel God to say, well, I'm going to pop in my, my uh -huh. inspiration here and there, but I'm, I'm not going to leave it constant. Uh -huh. So I'm going to inspire the apostles to preach the gospel and to write scripture, and then I'm going to take that back. Hmm. And then several centuries later, I'm going to give it back to you for a little bit so that you figure, figure out what scripture is. And then I'm going to take it back, and you have scripture to figure out on your own. Hmm. That seemed very odd, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't settle for that. Huh. It, the only plausible explanation w was that God had set an authority that was passed on so that people knew what to believe when there was no scripture, mm. or when there was no canon, rather. And then he left it intact so that they could come up with a canon, they could be led to know what was the word of God and what was not. Mm. And then God was not cruel enough to then take that away and abandon us to our own intuitions and our, our own interpretations of that word of God. He left that authority intact so that we would continually be led throughout all the time to know what that really represents, what it is really saying. Did, did you start reading the early church fathers at all? Did they play a part in this? Yeah, and um, you know, it, it was you just- You probably never read them before. I mean, that's No, I hadn't, and, and, and that was actually, it was a hard thing to do. It was a hard thing to do because I had always been taught that um, anything, anything extra biblical, any text extra biblical, what's the point? And you might even be endangering your faith by doing that. Um, although I read people like Max Lucado and things like that right. and didn't think anything of that. Right, right. Um, so it was very hard for me to read the Church Fathers, but I did it historically because I knew, having a history minor, that um, when you want to know what the people thought at that point in time, even what one person or a group of people thought, you look at the primary texts. Hmm. And so I approached the Church Fathers not as theological educators, but as primary texts, representatives of that era. And the thing that shocked me was I came across a letter written by St. Ignatius of Antioch, written to the church in Smyrna around the year 103 AD. And what he said is, um, he was basically uh, rebutting um, a, a, her a heretical group, yeah. uh, and he said that they do not hold fast to the Eucharist in prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus Christ. Yeah. In those words, and that was just a revelation to me. I couldn't, I couldn't believe this. Um, but it said two things. You could take it either way. It said, one, that somebody did believe, at least one person, a bishop, believed that the Eucharist was the body and blood of Christ at that point in time. But it also said that some people did not. And I had always been raised thinking that, um, well, being taught that the church that we live in, the Protestant church that I, that I was part of, that's basically how the early church was. And in the Middle, in the middle Ages, uh, that's when the Catholic Church came, came around and, and, and they started 
changing things and it became corrupted. But in the very beginning, it was basically they believed what we believe, they, they taught what we t teach, and they lived how we live. But what I discovered is, at least in 103 AD, there was at least one guy that did not. Yeah. So I looked at some of the other church fathers close to that era so that, you know, I didn't get to that era where the, the Catholic Church began to, began to manip manipulate uh, doctrines and things. And um, what I discovered was, um, yeah, there were other people that, that didn't believe the Eucharist was the body and blood of Christ. But um, universally, the church spoke out against that. Mm -hmm. And universally, that was defended by leaders in the church. And throughout all of time, it was echoed. That in this debate over the Eucharist, being the, the blood of Christ and not being the blood of Christ, being the flesh of Christ, not being the flesh of Christ, um, that I could see in 103 AD, it continued for a while, but there was one cohesive voice that said, yes, it is, hmm. by the leadership in the second and third century. Hmm. That is as, a close, as close to the apostles as you can pro probably dream of getting. I think the last apostle died in around 90 AD. So 103 AD, that's a mere 13 years later. I do not think that the church was, was uh, that changed hmm. in that short period of time to have people defending the Eucharist in that Scope. That's why those apostolic fathers, those ones who we believe, uh, learn their faith from the apostles themselves, have such a powerful witness, right. uh, like Ignatius of Antioch. Right. Uh, Newman himself, uh, the Anglican priest back in the mid-1800s, uh, was eventually a convert to the church, John Henry Cardinal Newman, um, studied something that really confirms what you, were, that you discovered, and that was he did a study when he was an Anglican about the Arian heresy of the fourth century. And when he did that study, he came out of it with the idea that he kept studying these heretical groups and always found that they were much more in the position of being the Protestants. Mm -hmm. And the Catholics were the ones that defended the position of the church. And the Arian heresy is the good example, is that really Arian, Arianism is sola scriptura, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. is a group rejecting what the general belief of the church was and taking their own interpretation of how they saw the Bible and then running with it, running, running with it and saying that that was true and not what the church had always, had always taught. Right. Before we take a break, why don't you tell the audience what you're doing now? I mean, here, the Lord brought you into the church. That's one thing, but uh -huh. of all things, what are you doing now? Right now, I am working for um, the Newman Foundation at the University of Illinois campus in Champaign-Urbana. Um, we have kind of three prongs to the foundation. Uh, St. John's Chapel, which is the prong that I work for, uh, which ministers to the students and the, and the staff and faculty at the University of Illinois. Um, Newman Hall, which is a dorm ministry to the, to the students. And then the Institute of Catholic Thought, which is devoted to um, furthering Catholic thought and educating through classes and things like that. We've even set up to, Catholic classes that we've set up to um, be available to students even for credit toward their U of I degree. And so what I do is I, uh, I do the coordination for the RCIA program. I coordinate some other catechetical ministries and uh, kind of taking up the mission and the cross of um, that place that, that helped bring me to, to the church. Well, Father Pac will want me to pass along his stamp of approval to your program <laughs> to, to the audience, a good, a good secular university, but yet with a great Catholic witness there mm -hmm. in the Newman Center, great Newman Center, mm -hmm. through Dr. Howe works and, uh, and all the work that you're doing there. And so I wanted to, like Father, uh, uh, Pack was said, you know, pass along my stamp of approval uh -huh. so people know it's a good place to look for if you're looking for a place to, for your, your young people to go. It's, it's, uh, ve it's very vibrant. Very, Holy Spirit is definitely right. working there. Well, thank you, Sean. We're going to take a break, come back in a little bit with your questions, and I uh, will see you in a bit. Welcome back. Our guest tonight is Sean Reeves. Thank you, Sean, for sharing this. It's so hard to share your whole 
journey of faith in what 15 20 minutes oh yeah but, <laughs> time flies i didn't realize it was but thank you for that you gave a nice very fine summary of the catholic apologetic versus sola scriptura thank you for that i i really hope that those of you who are outside outside the catholic church would listen uh, to sean's argument i think he put a, a very fine presentation of the flaws of sola scriptura um and i didn't see it for a long time 40 years i didn't mm -hmm. see it and but thank God. Uh, and, and that's what I love about your story also, is that uh, on the one hand, it's kind of like deja vu all over again. I mean, I, it, it sounds so often like the journey I've heard so many people on over the last uh -huh. six years. But in, in my mind, that's, that's because we see the Holy Spirit working in very similar ways mm -hmm. in so many people, particularly at that pillar of sola scriptura, because when that falls, mm -hmm. then Protestantism really has a problem. So thank you for your witness. Let's, uh, let's take our uh, email first, I think. I think that's what they're asking me to do here. This is Pat from Indianapolis, and then I think we have a caller waiting for us. Uh, the email says, hello, I am a lifelong Protestant investigating the Catholic Church and preparing for RCIA this fall. You're involved with RCIA, right? I am. That's right. One question that I still have not had answered regards the difference between the Catholic and Protestant Bibles. Could you please help me understand why the Jewish and Protestant faiths rejected the additional books of the Old Testament that they refer to as apocryphal. As a student at a Christian college, I was taught that these books contain serious historical inaccuracies that undermine the doctrine of inerrancy. I would appreciate learning more about the Catholic view of this issue. Thank you, Pat, for your question. Well, you're not a biblical scholar, Sean, but... Uh, uh, but I do know the answer. Okay, great. This, great. this, this does come up quite a bit in RCIA. Um, it's interesting because the, the, the problem we're facing is essentially two Christian traditions that sprouted from two Jewish traditions. And correct me if I get this wrong, but um, between the time of, of, of Christ and the last uh, scripture that the Protestants would accept, there were a number of scriptures that were written, not in Hebrew, but in other languages, primarily Greek. Um, over time, you had the Greek community, which uh, was originally all settled in Israel and Judah, at, conquered by numerous different um, communities around them. The Assyrians came in and, they, and they, they conquered Israel. Then the Babylonians came and conquered Judah and took all the, the leaders, the Israelite leaders, away and uh, put them in exile. Well, then they were allowed to come back. The Persians invaded and later the Greeks. And so you had what's called the diaspora. You have these groups of Jewish people that spread across away from their homeland. Well, they were incorporated into those communities and even adapted into their languages, um, primarily around the time of, of, the, of the Greek occupation where some Jewish people didn't speak Hebrew anymore. They spoke Greek. And so what needed to be done uh, was some of them were saying, well, we can't really read our texts anymore. We don't know how to read Hebrew. Let's translate them into our dialect, into Greek. And there was a community in um, Alexandria that took up this charge to to make a uh, compilation of scripture in their dialect. And there are several traditions about how this was. Some, one tradition says that there were there 70, 72 scribes split into groups of two who uh, worked and came up with the compilation. They, they, each group came up with the same books to put in the compilation. There's another, there's another tradition of, of 70 scribes. It took them, I believe, 70 scribes. It took 70 days to translate it and put it together. There are different traditions about that. But basically what came out of it is what's called the Septuagint. Uh, septa for 70. Um, and they, they translated the text of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, but then they also added a few of these texts that, that we have in the Catholic scriptures. Um, what, what happened, there was a problem then, because the, the Jewish community in Judah didn't accept these texts. They weren't happy with that. However, the Jewish community in Alexandria and, and, uh, and, and the Greek Empire in the north near what used to be Israel and above that and, and Assyria what used to be Syria, they did accept these scriptures. So you have two different Jewish traditions. You have one that said, no, we don't accept these extra books, uh, mostly because they weren't written in Hebrew, they were written in other languages, so they were kind of, you know, you know lower uh, beneath the other, the other books. And then you have this other group of what's called the Hellenistic Jews, those Jews that spoke Greek, um, who accepted these extra books. Well, around the time of Christ, the apostles um, they lived in that same environment, that Greek-speaking environment. So the Old Testament that they would have used was right. the Septuagint. With all the books. With all the books in it. So the Catholic tradition has always upheld those books as part of Scripture because the apostles did. The apostles took that tradition of the Hellenistic Jews. 
Well, in the, in the, in the uh, Reformation, what happened was Luther said, well, I'm going to go back to the root of things. And the, 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 the Jews from Judah didn't accept these books, so I'm not going to either. That's going to be my compilation. And so you have two ch Christian traditions really based off of two Jewish traditions. Right. Very good, very good summary. I'm trying to think of a book that I would recommend that might... Um, I think there's a, a book that I might recommend called Where We Got the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an old reprint, 100-year-old reprint of a book. I think Catholic Answers now reprints it. I think Tan did also, but it's called Where We Got the Bible. And it's a series of lectures given by a priest about 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a good lay-level summary of all the issues behind the Bible that I might recommend to folk in case you're interested in a book that would cover that. But mm -hmm. fine job, Sean. Let's take our first caller, Rick from Michigan. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hi, I'm very interested in your subject tonight. And um, uh, I've been studying uh, some commentaries on the Bible, the Catholic commentary called the New Jerome Biblical Commentary. Yeah. And this is uh, quite an eye-opening uh, sort of book about uh, the Bible because there's a, there's a strong view emerging in Catholic scholarship that uh, there's a lot of fiction in the Bible. Yeah. And, uh, for example, uh, one example would be the first books of Genesis, first chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, there's scholarship that says that... Um, that uh, we don't really know what the words and deeds of Jesus Christ were. Yeah. And this is, this is Catholic scholarship, yeah. and this kind of blows me away. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I'll blow you away. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll save my reserve my thoughts. Shall I let you run first with it? Or? Sure. Um, well, one thing that in, in, in Catholic scholarship of Scripture, again, I'm not a Scripture scholar, but what little I do know is that um, the Catholic Church uh, teaches that, um, you know, the apostles didn't walk behind Jesus with a notebook writing everything down. Um, like I said earlier in the show, uh, the Gospels weren't written until several centuries after Christ's death and resurrection. So what happened during that time between Christ's death and resurrection and the actual recording of the Gospels and much of the, the letters as well? Well, what they did is they took the truths and the life of Christ, the experiences that they had, the things that he said, and they pondered over them. They expanded on them. So. Everything in, in Scripture is not necessarily literal. Um, we can, I mean, we know for a fact that, that Christ was a historical figure. We know for a fact that, that something moved these people to continue with the gospel, even under penalty of death. Um, but some of the teachings that, they, that Christ said, um, they recorded and then maybe expanded upon. Um, not, not adding to the Word of God, but expanding its meaning. Um, because they were inspired to write these things. And so we would say that, that they, they recorded some, they expanded others, and um, do you have any more to say about that? Yeah, sure. I, in fact, I would encourage the Catholics to look at your catechism on the issue of the Scripture because it talks about, in other words, uh, you know, God speaking through these inspired authors and how to understand the Scriptures. And, uh, yeah, let me give opinion. This is just my opinion. I'm not speaking for the church here. I'm giving mm -hmm. my thought. Because the, the struggle that I see is, especially over the last, uh, let's say, 50 years in the Catholic Church and then longer in Protestantism particularly, there's always been this struggle on the issue of authority. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, you have the book, and then a person reads it and studies it and then gives an opinion about the meaning there. Well, what's the authority behind that person speaking? And it just seems to me, especially in the last 40 or 50 years, we have an awful lot of scholars that want themselves to be considered the magisterium. They want their view and opinion on Scripture to be considered at the same level of the authority of the church. And the danger is that on the one hand, though scholars have the, the training and the calling, the vocation, to do this kind of study and speculation, mm -hmm. my personal view is that a lot of it should have stayed in the classroom and in the research lab and not put in the study notes of study Bibles because sadly, we pick up some even Catholic study Bibles that in the notes are expressed as if truthfully nothing uh, that's short of hypothesis. For example, the, the, what's called the documentary hypothesis on the writing of the first five books of the Old Testament, the JEPD theory. It's a theory. It's an idea. It's a, something that can't be proven. It's something that's novel. It's caught wind over the last hundred years, started in Protestantism. But it's put in the study Bibles where the laity pick up the Bible and they read it without the background to understand. This is scholarly mm -hmm. uh, theatrics. 
I mean, they're trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. And I, especially in the last 50 years, we've seen a lot of freedom in that. And so I'm very cautious on particularly the contemporary study Bibles. Uh, in, in a way, in my mind, it's a little bit of what you might call the Protestant spirit let loose in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, instead of trusting the, the church to teach that which is true, we have this kind of new magisterium that's risen up of new opinions on the interpretation of Scripture. That doesn't mean that there aren't things in Scripture that aren't fiction, stories, that, that also that there aren't things that are expressed literally that maybe shouldn't be taken literally. But you see, that's why we trust the authority of the church rather than every individual that may have the credentials on his shelf. He may have five PhDs. Well, the one thing I learned a long time ago is that I knew several PhDs who disagreed with one another. Mm -hmm. And that alone proves that having a PhD doesn't make you infallible. <laughs> so the beauty is where is the, who said that? We're mm -hmm. back to our topic. Right. Who says you don't have to believe the Bible? Who says that's fiction? Where does that come from? What are you basing that on? The danger is that we'll be drawn to a, an opinion by a very charismatic person. Mm -hmm. And so we take what they say uh, without examination. And we're drawn back to trust, well, what has the church said? And how can I trust the church on particular issues? There are certainly lots of things in scriptures where we have a, a lot of freedom to understand it the way we want. Mm -hmm. But we should always do, as it says in scripture, on the one hand, trust the Lord with all your heart. But on the other hand, don't lean on your own understanding. Right. Because we might be wrong. In that. Right. All right, that was a long-winded answer. There, <laughs> throw that in. That's when it hits me close to the heart because of what I've seen scholars do with destroying people's faith. Let's take our next caller, Eva from Kentucky. What's your question for us tonight? Well, I'd like to ask your guest uh, how come he didn't go to his mother. He went to his father and asked him what he believed and what he thought about the Protestant Church. I mean, and he told the father told him that that. Uh, uh, in so many words that it was the true church because it was with the Bible. Yeah. Well, how come he didn't go to his mother and get the truth from her? <laughs> That's it's right. the source of it. I didn't hear him especially say one word about her. Especially this close to Mother's Day. You know, <laughs> especially this close to Mother's Day. Um, well, uh, one correction I want to make is that um, my father didn't lead me in one direction or another. My parents both let me choose uh, which direction I wanted to go. Um, and my father never, never said that you know, my church is, is the true church. He's, um, my father is the epitome of ecumenical hope. He would, he would never uh, cast such divisions. Um, he was in the military and, and, and was a chaplain's aide at one point in time, and they asked him, uh, you know, are you Catholic or, or are you Protestant? Wh which one do you want to help? Help the priest or help the Protestant minister? He said, well, neither. I'm, I'm Christian. And so he helped both. Mm -hmm. And so he never really um, get, cast judgment on me or anything like that. Uh, my, my decision really didn't come from uh, a guidance really from either one of my parents, but just my own experience. Um, uh, I, I really didn't, didn't, didn't look to uh, either of them, not out of any rebellion or anything like that, but just because I knew what I was experiencing, I knew what I felt most comfortable with, um, and um, uh, neither one of them want, really wanted to impose anything upon me. So. In fact, uh, uh, one detail from your story I remember earlier had to do with the Sacred Heart. And I mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit because you know, on the one hand, you weren't formed as a Catholic, per se, mm -hmm. but yet you had picked up some Catholic thoughts. And right. the issue, so the Sacred Heart is one right. of those issues that's very foreign to Protestant right. uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and oddly enough, it was my father that introduced me to the Sacred Heart. <laughs> he, again, he was in the military, and so he would, he would go on what's called um, TDY at times, tour of duty. Um, and he went to, uh, I believe it was Washington, D.C. this one time, and brought back um, the image of the Sacred Heart mounting on, on wood. And um, my, my father was not the type of Protestant that, that thought the images were idolatry. Um, we, ha we had a crucifix in our home as long as I can remember. Okay. So he brought this back to me, and it was, it was fascinating uh, because um, I know my, bro my, my father brought it to me because it was an image of Christ, an image of, of mm -hmm. our heart. Uh, our home was a very Christian home, and so the heart of our home was, was mounted there on, on mm -hmm. that wood. But, um, to me, I just found it fascinating because I had never seen an image like that before, where you had you know Christ's heart there and it had a flames on it, um, as if as if um, uh, he was reaching out to me 
through his heart. And the odd thing about this painting was that um, I, I had it hung in my room, and the way it's painted, the eyes will follow you. And so it was always like Jesus wa was watching me. And, and even, even, even the expression on his face, it was, it was kind of like when I did something bad, he was kind of frowning at me. And, and when I did something good, he was, he was, he was smiling at me. And so um, this became more or less a, a revelation of my relationship with Christ, that Christ was always watching me. Wherever I was, he was always watching me. And his heart longed for me. And it was a dear, dear image to me. And it wasn't until later on, really into my teenage years, that I realized it, it was a Catholic thing. It wasn't a Christian thing in the, in the general scope. All right. So. Stick our next caller, Laura from California. What's your question for us tonight? Good evening. Hello. Um, I wanted to tell you first of all that I really enjoyed your book, <laughs> Up from a Foundation. Oh well, thank you very much. Good. I thought thing. it was great. Yeah, I have a question for you and your guest. Um, my husband is uh, extremely reluctant to study any Catholic material. I'm Catholic. He's an Evangelical Christian, and um, he doesn't want to study any of it because he's afraid of being sucked in. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any, um, maybe, advice or a, a counter-argument for any of his arguments as to why he shouldn't ca study Catholic material or just anything that might help me break through this wall of, yeah. of reluctance that he's built. You mean, you mean besides getting him to read How Firm a Foundation? Uh. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe not that one yet. <laughs> I understand. You know, that, that needs a, a bit of grace to... To hopefully open up the heart for someone who's reading that book of fiction, I hope they enjoy it. But uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I mean, first, first I want to say that he's he's not alone. That's exactly how I felt too. Was um, I? <laughs> I knew I really didn't believe enough to be Protestant, but I didn't believe enough to be Catholic, and I didn't want to be sucked into the Catholic Church. I I didn't want to be Catholic. It was a very hard thing because I grew up thinking everything Catholic is wrong. And some of my peers even thought it was, you know, more or less a sin to even study some of these things about the Catholic faith. And so it was a very difficult thing for me to do. And so I completely empathize with him that, you know, that's like leaving a life behind. You're leaving your Protestant life behind if you become Catholic. And, and it's hard to grapple over, um, boy, do I really want to make myself that vulnerable? Um, but the second thing is, and I can only tell you my experience, is that, um, uh, you know, have him study what actually occurred, yeah. what actually occurred in the early church. If you want to get as close to Christ, as close to what Christ has actually taught and what the apostles taught, look at what people thought and believed at that point in time, closest to him. And, and often books of biographies like Surprised by Truth or, or our book Journeys Home or, or, or like the stories here on the Journey Home program, uh, have a way of introducing them to real people with great sincerity um, and then in the midst of their story, there's apologetics that he can examine for himself mm -hmm. to see whether it makes sense to him uh, and gives him something to chew over and uh, to see if the spirit is in fact helping him see that it is real and true. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean, how about in closing, uh, you've been in a Christian home all your life. Mm -hmm. You've been involved with Christ all your life. In what ways has your journey into the Catholic Church strengthened your faith in Jesus? Well, um, you know, when, when I came into the Catholic Church, there were two things that I still were not, was not convinced upon. That's the Eucharist and Marian devotion. And um, I could see it in scripture, but was not impressed and, and couldn't believe it. Um, but I, I knew that the church was the authority I was looking for, that the church was what, uh, what I sought. And so I abandoned myself to the authority of the church. I abandoned myself and said, if they teach it, it must be true. And, and now those are the two dearest things in my heart. And in um, and the Eucharist, that's that nearness to Christ that as a Protestant I sought so much. I knew him uh, in prayer. I, I, I read about him. I longed to be with him. And I was with him spiritually, but now I'm with him physically. Um, it's kind of like this afternoon I called my wife to let her know I was okay. I made it here okay. And I could hear her voice. I had a memory of her. I could think of her. But I wanted to be with her. Mm. And that's what I experience in the Eucharist, is that now I'm with Christ. And the other thing is the, the Lord's passion, or what we as, as Catholics um, call the, the way of the cross or the stations of the cross, walking with Christ uh, and being with him. All right. So. Sean, thank you very much for your witness and being thank on the you. program.
God bless you and your work with, thank the, you. with the Newman Institute, right? The, yes. Okay, and thank you for that. And, and stay with us. We'll be back in a moment with some final words for the journey home. Welcome back. Uh, just a couple of corrections, uh, uh, emails of people that making sure that we're saying things right here. Make sure we wanted to make sure that we didn't say that the Gospels were done centuries later, but they were written decades later after the death and resurrection of Christ. And someone said, I, I left you hang and which good study Bible to recommend. I strongly recommend the, um, uh, the Navarre Study Bible, which you can get here from EWT, EWTN's catalog. Um, and I think also the original Jerusalem Bible and the notes in that are good. You can get those here from EWTN. A, a scripture I thought would be fitting to, to end with comes from the letter of Ephesians that Paul wrote. And again, remember, this was written maybe about the time that the Gospels are being written and released, uh, maybe even before, certainly before the Gospel of John, and long, long before the canon of Scripture came together. And Paul writes in chapter 4 of Ephesians, listen to this. Verse 11, and his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So he lists the authoritative uh, leaders in the church carrying on the deposit of faith to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. The Lord Jesus had appointed his twelve, the apostles. They appointed teachers and prophets. The early church authority all built on that authority of the apostles to, to the equipping of the saints so they wouldn't be tossed around by every wind of dogma. But when you throw out the authority of the church, what do you end up with? The confusion that we see all around us with everyone trying to decide for themselves what they are to, be, to believe. And as was for Sean and myself, we came back to the Church of the Apostles because we could trust that authority so we could know how to understand the Scripture for our lives and to truly know our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure. I hope this has been a strengthening time for you. God bless. I'll see you again next week.